Hello. I'm so glad you're going to join me tonight. My name is Pastor Susan Cousineau, and it is Tuesday, June 16th at 7 p.m. And this is going to be week two of the series that I'm doing called Your Journey. Such a privilege for me to be able to come to you and for you to be able to listen and glean and receive from me. So I want to pray for us before we get started. All right, pray with me, please. Jesus, I take it as a great privilege and responsibility to teach people your word, Lord. And I just ask for your presence to be here with us, your anointing, Lord, on these words, not only on my speaking, but on those who will be hearing. I pray, God, that you would encourage and strengthen them, Lord, in their inner man. And I pray, Lord, that what you are empowering and calling them to in this hour, that you would enable them to fulfill it. I declare that Satan is bound in the name of Jesus from this time together and from these teachings, and that all distractions or disruptions would also be bound and limited in the mighty name of Jesus. Give us hearts to receive and ears to hear your truth. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. So the first in the series that I did was on Ministry of Helps and the Fivefold uh, Ministry. And tonight it's going to be about serving. But you know, I don't think that the time that we're living in needs Christianity tips and techniques, a five-step process or a new program to help us achieve our spiritual goals. Do you? I believe God has put you here on earth at this time to accomplish his purposes for your life. And also, the journey that your life has taken so far is not by chance or just by your decisions or the actions of others. Because God can take all of your past and use it, redeem it, fix it, and he will cause all of it to work together because you love him and are called according to his purposes. And actually the difficulties and the trials help prepare you so you can relate and help other people who have gone through similar things that you have. To serve God, this teaching tonight is about servanthood and serving. We have to first know God, right? We can't just know about God. We have to have our own hearts filled up, our own hearts healed. And the only way that we can give out to others is if we're full ourselves. Our example, of course, for serving is Jesus and our power source is the Holy Spirit. I love that Jesus, when he ascended to heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit. He didn't say, I hope you make it down there, guys. Follow the rules and the rituals. No, he gave us the Spirit of God to empower us, live right inside of us, to speak to us and to guide us. I don't know about you, but I don't think we can just grit our teeth and try to love people. How's that been working for you? It hasn't worked for me. We have to have God's help and his power. Last week I talked how everyone is in ministry and that doesn't mean you stand behind a pulpit or you're on Facebook Live. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, Jesus gave some to be in the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and then he gave most to be in the ministry of helps. And by the way, the handouts and the notes are available on my webpage, which is thewisewarrior.org. And also last week's teaching is recorded there and on my Facebook page. We are all called to serve. We see such conflict and turmoil in the earth today. Wow. God has chosen you to be a part of it all at this time. But we have to look to the actions of Jesus to know what to do and how to help. I do not think we're going to show people the true living gospel, which is us as Christ's representatives, 
by winning debates, shouting people down, or refusing to listen to their perspective. Jesus never did that. Jesus did not insist on his own rights, and he refused to condemn others. What he did was invited them to be aware of their own humanity. He always showed love and forgiveness, and he said those are more important than just being right. Remember the story about the woman caught in adultery? I love that story. The townspeople were going to stone her to death. Today, we cast verbal stones. But what did Jesus do? He looked around and he confronted everyone there with their own sins. And he never condemned that woman. I always wonder, where was the guy who was involved in this? That is where the message of your journey begins, how to function and to serve God in the kingdom. And that is the title of this, The Power of Serving. And then I'm also gonna talk about our attitude. So in your outline, that's on, on my webpage. Um, for tonight, I had another title called Obedience, but I'm gonna address that later in the series. So here's a quote. This world will be a better world when the power of love replaces the love of power. The world or our world systems, they try to tell us what determines our worth and our power. But Jesus has to always be our primary example. And this is what the Bible tells us about him. In Philippians 2, 5 through 15, in the New King James, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I call this the divine condensation. I think we only have a slight, a tiny understanding of what Jesus left in heaven and what is waiting for us when we get to heaven. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And I don't know about you, but I have a really good imagination. Jesus left an incredible place and came down here to be a man so we would have somebody to follow and understand because we can't really understand God in who he is, but we can see God in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus' humility led to his exaltation. Jesus said in Matthew 20, 28 about himself, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I don't know about you, but when I hear about serving and loving people, I just feel like I fall so far short. But do you know, there is tremendous power released when we choose to serve, expecting or desiring nothing in return. Now, some people, some personalities are better at that than others. This quote, these words by Henry Varley, a British revivalist, were spoken to D.L. Moody in 1873 and recorded in the book, Crucial Experiences in the Life of D.L. Moody. He says, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. By God's help, I aim to be that man. So how can we get the same attitude as Jesus? The first thing is, of course, we have to be born again. And when we are born again, that means God's spirit connects with our spirit and we are changed 
were transferred from darkness into God's kingdom. And we become a new creation. It says the old has passed away and behold all things, and that means all things have become new. That's in 2 Corinthians 5.17. I love that scripture. The second thing to have the same attitude and abilities as Jesus is we have to lose our life. That means life on your own terms. This is what I call Christianity 101. And I don't hear it preached a lot of places. In John 12, 24 through 26, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, my father will honor him. The key in the scripture, oh, there's many, but the one is, let him follow me. We become, first of all, children of God. In John 1, 12, it says he gives us the right to become children of God. And he doesn't want us to stay children, right? In Romans 8, 14, he says the sons of God are led by the spirit of God. So being a Christian is just not a one-time statement. It's not just a one-time act, right? It is a journey. And that's why these series, the series is called Your Journey. It's walking with Jesus. And it implies that he's leading and we are following. In Luke 16, 13, in the Passion Translation, it says you cannot serve two masters. And I know it talks about money, but listen to this translation in verse 13. It is impossible for a person to serve two masters at the same time. You will be forced to love one and reject the other. One master will be despised and the other will have your loyal devotion. It's no different with God and the wealth of this world. You must enthusiastically love one and definitely reject the other. Did you know that whatever you serve will rule you? That's right. Let me give you an example. In Genesis 2, um, we're all familiar with Adam and Eve, right? We blame them for a lot of stuff. <laughs> In 16, Genesis 2, 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely eat the fruit from every tree of the garden, but only from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil shall you not eat. Otherwise, on that day that you eat from it, you most certainly will die because of your disobedience. The judgment God handed down in Genesis 3, the results of what they did when they ate of that tree. First of all, the judgment, he says to the snake, to Satan, God promises that he will be defeated. And then to the man, the judgment was, he is going to try and find his life and his purpose for living in his work. And then to the woman, he says, your desire shall be for your husband and he will rule over you. What this means, in other words, is your desire is turning away from me, God is saying, and it is turning now to your husband. And he will reign or rule over you. In other words, how many women try to find life vicariously through their men? We see that even in the little girls when they're first interested in boys. And how many men try to find fulfillment in their jobs? God must be our source. And all other people, all other things are just a resource. Some examples. If food rules you, then you're a slave to food. You do not eat to live, you live to eat. If pornography rules you, you're a slave to it. If money rules you, it becomes your master. If a particular person is the most important thing in your life, that person rules you. Whatever we think will satisfy our longing will become our God. You know, when my kids were little, they had this great music series, and it was called The Donut Man. And he said, we are donut people. We have a hole in the middle of our heart. 
and it, the thing is, it's only a God-shaped hole or void. Nothing that we cram in there is going to complete us or fulfill us. That's why people who don't know God personally walk around feeling empty all the time. So the question really is, what is the kingdom of God? If that's where we're supposed to live and that's where we serve, the answer is really simple. It's Jesus is king. He must rule us. He is not going to force us to be um, like a slave, you know, or a puppet. I'm going to love God. I'm going to serve God. No, we are giving. Uh, he gives us a continual choice. In Exodus, it talks about bond servants. And they would serve six years for their master, but in the seventh year, they could go free if they chose. In Exodus 21, five through six, it says, but if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go free. Then his master shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, which is like a strong needle, and he shall serve him for life. In other words, God brings us to himself, and he's the one that judges our hearts, and we are the ones who decide if we want to be his bondservant. There are 57 references to the term bondservant in the Bible. In Ephesians 6, 5, it says, Bondservants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. In Luke 1, 38, in the Amplified, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her she would bear the Son of God, her response was, Behold, I am the bondservant of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And Paul in Romans 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. We are all called to be bondservants. Serving Jesus is voluntary, but it leads to our greatest fulfillment. It's what we were called and created to do. Does this sound too hard for you? In Matthew 22, 14, it says, for many are called, but few are chosen. In other words, many are called or invited, but very few answer the call or accept the invitation. We think that serving God is going to take away our fun. Or maybe when we're older or when things settle down, we're not so busy, then maybe we'll serve God. Jesus also had many that turned away from him, especially when he told them what it would cost them. In John 6, 41 it, and through 69, and I'm not going to read all of that, but 66 says, as a result of this, many of his disciples abandoned him and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12 disciples, do you want to leave too? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You are our only hope. We have believed and confidently trusted, and even more, we have come to know by personal observation and experience that you are the Holy One of God, the Christ, the Son of the living God. I don't know about you, but I think possibly when Jesus asked Peter the question, maybe he looked around to see if there were some other options. But he, know, but he knew the only way was to serve Jesus, that he was the true way of living. Serving God brings us joy. It's what we were created to do and gifted to do. John 15, 11, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. The acronym for joy is J, Jesus, first, O, others, second, and Y, yourself, last. When we think about serving, we may ask, well, gosh, I'm not sure how to serve God or what he's calling me to do. But that's what it means to be led by the Spirit and to allow Jesus to lead our lives. He's going to show you exactly what to do. And it may not be easy, 
but it's going to be the greatest joy you've ever experienced. In John 15, 15, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. In the Passion Translation, it says, I have never called you servants because a master does not confide in his servants and servants do not always understand what the master is doing. But I call you my most intimate friends for I reveal to you everything that I've heard from my father. Isn't that amazing? We wonder what's going on in the world. Jesus will reveal it to us. We wonder what to do with questions and decisions in our lives. Jesus is our closest friend and ally, and he will show us and tell us what to do. It's amazing. People think Christianity is boring. Oh my gosh. It's the most exciting way to live our lives. God has chosen, he has purchased, and redeemed us. We get to be his friends here on earth, and to show how much we love him, we get to serve him, and then in heaven, we get rewarded for it. He empowers us to serve and then rewards us for it when we're done. Whatever God asks you to do, this is how to perform it. In Colossians 3, 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. And then in Matthew 9, Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. You know, all Jesus needs from you is a willing heart. That's it. He's going to show you and empower you how to serve and what to do. And I tell you, there are many, many out there who need to know that Jesus is real and loves them. No questions asked. Not because of what they've done or what they haven't done, but that he is the true way of living and they need him. There will continue to be a great harvest of people coming into the kingdom. And God has chosen you to be the one who shows them Jesus. I'm asking you, will you answer this call? God is not only interested in what you do with your obedience and, and serving, but also having the right heart and the right attitude. And he also wants you to be in the right place at the right time, doing what he's called you to do, no matter how insignificant or how amazing it might be. So attitude is really a key here. So I want to ask you, do you regularly have a pity party and you are the guest of honor? And maybe because of the quarantine, you're the only guest? I have to confess that I have had a bad attitude many times in my life. Many pity parties, for sure. You know, we have to check what I call our tude and we need to check ourselves without asking your friends or your family. So sometimes think about these questions to find out what your attitude is. Do I frequently feel defensive? Do I feel misunderstood most of the time? It's true, the times around us are very difficult and very different, and it's easy to fall into discouragement or fear. Daily, we must feel controlled many times by life situations, but that's not true because circumstances will come to us, but then we decide how we respond to them. We are not in control of what happens to us, but we are in control of our attitudes and the way we respond to it. No one, and I repeat, no one, can make you have a bad attitude or a bad day. You choose. Pastor Jim, my late husband and my uh, most amazing mentor, he used to say, you knew, never lose your peace over someone else's sin. You only lose your peace over your own sin. And I tell you, that's a challenge to live up to. But we have to remember, we are people of destiny. We are created for greatness. We are created to advance the kingdom of God and to forcefully advance them in the world systems today. It's not just an accident and it's not a light assignment. We have got to learn from our past mistakes and our hardships. We can't get stuck there. When you have an attitude, you and others usually can see it, right? Your posture changes, 
your back straightens, you might clench your fist or your teeth. Sometimes your arms plaster across your chest, your lips get tight, your eyes turn to slits and you might give someone the look or maybe you slump down and cry. Unfortunately, our attitudes can be caught and shared. At that moment, when you feel that nastiness coming over you, pause for a few seconds and think about what you're thinking about. Stinking thinking makes you weak. You don't want to give your power away to anyone or anything. Wisdom chooses to change your internal dialogue. So how can we do it? The scripture gives us a hint in Philippians 4, 8. Sum it all up, friends. I'd say you'll do your best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. That was from the message. I want to encourage you, don't let CNN, Fox, or the thousands of opinions that we're seeing on social media determine your truth. Our minds are like a hard drive on our computer. When we get a lot of negative input, we need to take those negative thoughts and we need to delete, delete, delete. But we have to not just delete them, then we have to replace them with truth. It's not easy. But I tell you, it gets easier the more we practice it. Do you know that science now has proven that we re retrain our thoughts? When we do that, the brain patterns will change their routes. It's true. So we don't have to stay in or constantly fight and battle to have positive thought patterns. This book by Dr. Caroline Leaf I highly recommend any of her books. This is the one called Switch on Your Brain. And she has studied the brain and she compares it to scripture and proves scripture, proves science through scripture. And she writes in her book, your mind can powerfully and unexpectedly change your brain in positive ways when you intentionally direct your attention. So instead of your brain changing your mind, your mind changes the way your brain functions. It actually creates new positive thought paths. It's amazing. God has designed our brains to actually grow new brain cells when we respond to stressful circumstances as a challenge and not as a threat. You know, we, we say that scripture all the time. Well, God just works everything for good, but it's for those who are called according to his purposes. So our bad stuff, our bad ways of thinking, the things that have been done to us, the things that we have done mistakenly or deliberately, God can use all of that and turn it around for our good and for the good of many. It's true. He doesn't waste any of our past. It's awesome. Adversity happens, right? And it doesn't play favorites. And it comes in all forms and all amounts. And our natural response might be, take this away. But do you know some of the greatest inventions and advances have been born out of adversity? There are thousands, really. But here's just a couple examples. At the time of Apple's computer, it, they were in a very dismal downtrend in the market. They produced the iPod. They had a bunch of failures, but they came up with some good ones. Concern over, over global warming and fuel dependency triggered hybrid automobiles. And today, in the face of disaster with COVID-19, it has come some of the greatest outpouring of kindness, pain, and fear and discomfort has been replaced with kindness and help and authenticity. People have stood up and been real. You know, God is just causing, calling us just to be our real selves. He's not causing us or calling us to be fake and say, oh, you know, I do everything right, or I've never had anything bad. No, he uses it 
to help and encourage and identify with what other people are going through. Pain, fear, discomfort, injustice are far more powerful motivators than their opposites. God uses our painful past to help us make progress in our present. So here's the question. How do we change our attitudes? If we know we have bad attitudes, how do we change? First of all, we have to examine our personal truths. What do you believe about yourself when nobody else is looking? Is your life based on truth? We generate the results that we believe we deserve. What you think about, you bring about. If we think that we're a failure, if we think we're out of shape, we're fearful, we're not good enough, we're not worthy, that we'll never be successful, I guarantee you it is because that is the truth you live in. And who told you that stuff anyway? In his book, uh, Tom, Dr. Tom Barrett, he asks the question, who put the jelly in your donut? Are you living out of a false self? Are you living lies that someone else told you are true and now you believe them? Maybe it was a high school coach who told you you'd never be good enough and you believe that about yourself for every area of your life. You know, that was my late husband, Pastor Jim. You may look at him and think, really? But it came a time when he realized that that was some nasty lies that he had been believing and basing his life on. Or maybe your mom said that you were a mistake and you weren't wanted. That was me. Maybe your teacher said, you're never gonna amount to anything. These words that people have spoken about you can become your core beliefs. You need to ask yourself, what do I believe and how long have I believed it? How did this belief get installed? Is it true what I'm believing? You need to compare it against what God says about you. What does God's word say about you? I think it's time for us to start believing what God says about us than what anybody else has said negatively. You have to change your internal dialogue. You know that argument you have in your head all the time? Sometimes it's yourself, sometimes it's the words of the enemy, sometimes it's what the world is blasting at you. You have to listen to that small, still voice of God, right? You choose what you think about and what you feel, and that releases tremendous power. Think about what you're thinking about, then change the negative thoughts. It can be done. It takes work and practice, but it can be done. And then your mind can actually change your brain. In 2 Corinthians 10, three through six, it says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and then you replace it with the truth of God's word. So you actually grab your thoughts, think about those thoughts, and then if they're bad, replace those thoughts. In aviation, they file a flight plan at the beginning of every flight, and that determines their destination. Our mental flight plan needs to be recalculated in order for our destination to stay on course. The joystick is the primary device that controls the direction of the aircraft. Isn't that interesting, the, joy crack, the joystick? So our attitude definitely determines our altitude. So I'm gonna say again, God needs you, just who you are, not who you are pretending to be, not the false self you're living out of, not who other people expect you to be, not what people have told you that you are, but the real you. It's good enough. It's who God created you to be. And he has given you gifts and given you the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can walk out the destiny that has already been prepared for you. I don't believe that we can just grit our teeth and serve God in this hour. 
We can't just determine, hey, I'm going to do a good job today. I'm going to serve God today. We have got to have help. We've got to have our hearts healed. And we've got to have our attitudes changed. It starts with surrender, just like Jesus. It said he humbled himself. He was God and he became a man. And we just have to humble ourselves and just say, God, I need your help. And I want to follow you. I want to be led by your spirit. I don't just want to remain a child. Or I don't want to just sit in a pew any longer. I want what you have for me. And it may not be easy. And it may not always bring the results that you want. It may have opposition. I guarantee you the kingdom of God is opposed. But the kingdom of God is going to remain forever. And it is going to advance and Satan's head is going to be crushed, just like it talked about when the first judgment was handed out to him. I want to invite you, first of all, into the kingdom. I want to ask you to obey the call that God has on your life. I want you to put aside your own agenda and pick up the agenda and the path that God has determined for you. This is really where your journey starts. And it is going to be the most exciting that you can ever imagine for your life. You want to be fulfilled. You want to have joy. You want to have an impact. You want to understand that you are achieving your purpose in life. This is how you start. I want to pray for you right now. So just put your hands out and surrender. God sees exactly where you are. Nothing we do or have done is hidden from him. And yet he loves us. It says he rejoices over you with singing. He isn't just loving. He loves us. He is love. And it's what the world is looking for today. We can't just work it up. We can't just follow a program. We can't just fill out some forms and figure out who we are. We have to have his enablement. And he is freely willing to give it to us. Jesus, I'm so thankful for the truth of your word. I'm thankful, Lord, that no matter what people have said or done, God, we are your child. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our righteousness comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We are in right standing with you, Lord. Lord, we don't earn it. We don't deserve it. The gifts that you've given us are grace gifts, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would forgive us right now. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, for trying to prove I'm something or live up to some standard. Lord, help me to see myself through the eyes of love, through the way that you see me, Lord, because that's the real truth and that's where life begins. I pray, Lord, that we would humble ourselves so that we wouldn't have to be humbled that we could offer our lives and our hearts up to you as a sacrifice, just as you did, Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see the way Jesus lived, help us to see the way you loved and lived, Lord, that you didn't bash people over the head, Lord, but you just love them and you help them see where they're at and what their need is. Lord, their need isn't for us. Their need is for you. Help us, Lord, to lay our lives down, to die to our own agenda, and pick up the life that you have for us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. We need a fresh infilling and a fresh empowerment. Lord, pour your truth into our mind and help our minds to grab the negative thoughts and replace it with what you say about us, Lord. Heal our hearts and heal our minds where we need it, as only you can. Jesus, you came to to heal the brokenhearted. And Lord, as we receive the healing and forgiveness, then we can offer that to other people. I pray, Lord, that the people that we need to forgive, those hard, difficult situations, as you reveal them to us, Lord, help us not to fight it off, but to embrace that pain and that grief and to get free of it. Lord, only when we're free and when we're full can we pour out to others and serve them. Help us to know, Lord, that whatever you call us to do as we're serving you, then we are serving people. And that's the only way that it can be done. Let your glory and protection be over us, Lord. I pray you give your angels charge over us, God. Help us to know that our feet are ordered 
and that you guide our steps. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Love you guys. I'm so excited to be a part of all the things that God is calling you to do, especially in this hour. It's no mistake that you're born in this time of history. God has amazing things for you to do on your journey. Bye.